Let me begin with a non-technical question. Um, imagine that I'm your uncle. And I didn't meet you before, but your family invited me to dinner, and I'm meeting you for the first time. And I went to university, and I studied sociology. And I'd like to know what you do, and particularly why it's important. Yes. <clears throat> so I would say what I do is I try to predict earthquakes. But because we cannot predict them, we are trying to forecast them because the perfect forecast would be a prediction. So first we need to be able to predict them, uh, to be able to forecast them. Well, I will just say that I'm trying to predict earthquakes so that people don't die. How is this going to help me stay alive? Um, is this good? Knowing that there's a multifractal distribution of distances between earthquakes and so forth. So the way that it's going to help you uh, stay alive is this. If you disregard that seismicity is distributed in a multifractal fashion, when you are, for example, creating forecasting models, you would smooth them differently. You would smooth them in a non-optimal way. However, if you realize what the fractal dimension of these earthquakes are, uh, you can use the fact that the multifractality of earthquakes results from the several aftershock sequences being uh, focused on singular points. And if you take into account this fact, you would be more focused on uh, mapping the capacity dimension of your fault network if you, you are able to see that it's a multifractal distribution. Because the, earth, the main shocks sample the capacity dimension being D0, which I can show you here. Okay, so in, in, so in essence, if we look at this, this example of multifractal thing. So what we have here, uh, okay, sorry. You ask why the multifractality matters. So the multifractality tells us that there are regions on our distribution which scale with a significantly different alpha exponent than other regions. Now remember, I'm your uncle. I don't know about alpha and multifractal, whatever. Well, well, in simple terms, I would say if you knew that seismicity is multifractal, you would be able to, uh, to, uh, to create better forecasts. Let, let, let me make my question more specific. Um, I've invested in some property in Monterey, California. And I've been told it's near fault and we should be careful about earthquakes. Is the work that you're doing going to tell me something that should change my view of the, the risk in this property of Monterey? Yes. For example, if the, if and I think there is, if the current seismicity hazard model, which is employed by your country, includes spatially varying B values, which are mapped at very small scales, probably they either overestimated your risk or underestimated your risk. So my work would tell you, no, the gutenberg richter law scales with a B value of one, so your risk is this, so you would be able to get a better representation of your risk through my work. Because people out there could be undersampling the, the seismicity distribution, and they could be misinterpreting your risk. Okay. Um, let me ask another um, only slightly different question. Um, imagine that I'm an investor, and I have a physics degree from University of California. And I've uh, created a software company and made a lot of money. And I would like to invest in something that will make the world better. And I'm thinking of some things like investing in research on material properties, which I know would be useful in nuclear power plants and other things where there are extreme conditions. And I'm also interested in hydrology, trying to find some way to help manage the water budget better. And I've also been 
approached by some people who are doing some very creative work in atmospheric sciences and global climate change. Is your work a better investment for me? And why, why would it be more important to invest with you rather than with some of these other options? Certainly, if you compare my work with is this the only field that you're comparing me? Oh, no, I have many others, of course. Certainly, there are more important fields. But make me interested. You know. No. I, I, frankly, I would tell you that, of course, there are fields where you would get more societal benefit for your buck than this field. This is a risky field. And in the short term, I cannot tell you that you would get uh, 10 bucks for the buck that you put in. In terms of society. But I'm not just interested in what's called societal benefit. I'm working in advancement of science, too. That, uh, that, that ex excites me. I think both are similar. Like, you cannot have societal advancement. Like, they, these, in my view, these are not separate things. Uh, scientific advancement, which does not improve societal conditions, is uh, not significant for me. I, I don't think it is uh, scientific advancement. So if you like, yes, that's my view on science, but that has nothing to do with my thesis. That's my view on science. <laughs> OK. Yeah, you might have a different view, Eddie. I have plenty more, but let uh, others take, take a chance, and I'll come back. Yes, continue, maybe, David. Yes. Oh, OK. So we will take it, yeah? So we will take it the next turn or uh, first of the Oh, that's a dangerous. They just to invite me to keep going. <laughs> I got to keep going. Do you want to, to mention the city of the moon? I have a question about the simulations that you do, which I think are a very powerful tool for testing the methods you have for estimating the statistical properties of earthquakes. And one of the ways you do that is you take an imaginary rectangle or a cube with some values on it, and then you replicate it to grow um, a network of points. And then you test your method on that network of points. How can you, well, first of all, why did you choose that kind of replication? And how can you assure that you're not developing a method that's special to the properties that you've put into your simulations, rather than the properties of real earthquakes. So I think you are talking about this paper, in particular, the barycentric fixed mass bed paper. Yeah, and there are other uh, other places where you use this. Yes. So in this paper, because we were introducing a new method for multifractal dimension estimation, we had to test it on known multifractals with a known fractal dimension. And we create them, as you say, by replicating uh, this a template right here. By replicating a template. Yes. And what we, but because we want to include also the stochasticity effect, we show you also the random replication of this thing. So in, you can either replicate this template by always keeping the, the configuration of the points constant, and you can also shuffle them at each replication. And this gives you a more realistic random replication, uh, random pattern. So uh, you need to do this uh, if you want to benchmark your measure. If you, if you want to say, OK, I know analytically what's the measure of this. And now I create a benchmark, and with, as I increase the number of points, this is what I get. So uh, if you ask now, what is, why should I think that earthquakes are created this way, there are uh, limited methods to create a multifractal. So one of them is this. The other one is the iterated function systems uh, that I know of. But uh, in terms of synthetics, it would give us similar results. Uh, and because we are aiming, aiming only at extracting the spatial statistics of this distribution, we think that these, these uh, methods for creating the synthetics are uh, more or less compatible with this. Because what I see in your question is that probably you are expecting like a physical system 
which when loaded will start creating these uh, fractal and multifractal segmentations by itself. Is that what you had in mind as an alternative? What I had in mind was that when you apply a statistical technique to a random pattern, that statistical technique tends to recognize randomness of a certain flavor. And it's the flavor that's in the statistical technique. And what you hope is to find that it recognizes something in common with itself and says, OK, this is what, what the data look like. Um, sometimes you apply a statistical test, you know, maybe something like a, a Fourier analysis of some time series data. And Fourier analysis assumes that there's some repetitive patterns and certain boundary conditions and so forth. And you apply it to, to something that doesn't have those, those patterns. It can still give you a spectrum, but isn't necessarily a spectrum that's meaningful for the actual data that, that you're considering. What I see in you know, a couple of your examples are that you um, simulate some maybe uh, uniform random data, and then you simu simulate some fractal or multifractal data, apply the, the method, you find out it works much better on the multifractals than it does on the, on the uniform. But could there not be other? Well, this is not what we do. We, we just, uh, because we don't, the, the way that we approach this thing is that because we do not know what seismicity really looks like and how it behaves, when we see a multifractal pattern of seismicity, we want to create something which maybe looks similar, which could give us a clue. Aha, maybe seismicity is more like this. Maybe seismicity is more like that. So we have no, uh, no doubt that our method is fully capable of extracting the, the fractal dimension, the multifractal spectrum, of, uh, correctly of any distribution, of any synthetic distribution. So in, in essence, when we give them a uniform distribution, we know that we will get a uniform uh, spec, uh, multifract, multifract spectral uh, spectrum back. So in essence, these, these uh, exercises that we do are just to give us a clue of what real seismicity looks like. That, that's why we do it. And the other day is a super simple answer to today. It's simply that you tested on all sets possible synthetic of all types, and you recover the correct factor dimension. So indeed, it gives you, you never prove anything, but that's, that's a short answer. Yeah, was that a question? No. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me ask you. Yes, yeah. yeah. it was the point. Yeah. But yeah, I did not pursue the question like this. Yeah. I thought that Dave did not uh, see what. So maybe we, we, we go on with questions. So yeah. we started with ex questions from external uh, members. So we will have a second one. I'm a bit external to this uh, science. Uh, okay. We are asking questions. Because the first part of your dissertation, you in your presentation, basically what you want to do is to estimate uh, some hazard risk. So you look at, uh, you want to estimate the risk of having an earthquake. So you divide uh, your region in cells and then you use frequencies to estimate the hazard risk. So if I come from uh, my field, then I will say, okay, I have an hazard risk to estimate and I will use a duration model, and which will be more efficient at using uh, frequencies to estimate this hazard risk. And I would moreover do some uh, statistical analysis so that I will be able to tell my uh, public, okay, this B in this region is different from this B in this region, and I can be sure of that at the 99.9% confidence interval. So, two questions. So why do you use frequencies, and do, are you using duration models somewhere in your thesis, uh, or and do you have uh, any uh, uh, significant uh, so analysis in terms of significant difference? In your okay, so... Uh let me show you. Because at some point you said that you had like a lot of sales with zero events, so that was not providing any information. But this is correct. So let me show you the significance analysis. So to, to answer your question, why are we using the frequency magnitude distribution? Uh, because this is a very robust. Uh, observable empirical law in, seism in seismology. 
So all the seismic hazard models are done based on this law. So uh, the main advantage of our method is uh, that the problem is that you cannot know how to define a region. You cannot take circles, you cannot take triangles, because nature does not give you uh, a hint of how it wants to be partitioned. That's why you use Voronoi cells, and by randomizing the Voronoi nodes, you are able to get various different partitionings. And you want to rank these models that you get in terms of likelihood, in terms of penalized likelihood. So that's the, the main idea here. The main problem is that you don't know these regions. So the, the, because the rate is constant, we, we assume that the rate is constant, that's why indeed our uh, duration model is a Poissonian model. And we just need to, to get this exponent. Once we get this exponent, we are, we are done. So in your first part, you, you estimated this B parameter? Yes. Uh, yes. And then you had like three different regions or some different... Uh, ah, okay, so... B in different places. So this gives you the probability of observing a single magnitude. And if you, if you tessellate a region like this, because you would have, let's say, 100 events, you are interested in the joint likelihood of observing them, given this B value. So that's how you write the formula of the joint likelihood. And then by summing up these log likelihoods for all different regions, you can calculate the total likelihood, the total log likelihood of the model. And then you need to penalize it, because the more Voronoi's that you put, the better your fit will get. That's why you need to penalize it. But you have a question on the title, uh, does the Gutenberg register law vary specially? Yes. And you have an answer, which is yes. Which is yes. But can you tell me how sure you are? With okay, this? so that's why I was showing you th this figure. So here you can see the biasing information criteria, the penalized likelihood per performance of a single b-value for the whole region. This is over here. And you can see that the random tessellations that you do, you can get models which are significantly better than this. So this gives you... What is meaning is significantly better? That's what I want to know. So can you convince me that it's really significantly better? Okay, so to convince you significant, what significantly better is. You fit... This, okay. Can see, but this is not okay, so you fit uh, the whole distribution with one b-value, you get a uh, likelihood, you get a bic, then what could be your uncertainties? The uncertainties could be magnitude. Uncertainties could be location uncertainties. You perturb your data set with all these uncertainties, you do the fits, and then you get a distribution of BIC values. Let's say that it's distributed around here. Then when you do the Voronoi tessellation of a single model, let's say that you consider this model, uh, the previous one that I showed you in the presentation. You do the same thing for him, and if these distributions are significantly different from each other, they do not overlap of, at 99% of confidence intervals, you can say that Indeed, there is a significant gain of my model. This is how you can test it. And it has been tested like this. Yes. Yeah, well, first, let me congratulate you. You did a nice study and improved our approach tremendously. But you also gave us some hints of how to interpret. And I want to follow up. I had another starting question, but I, I'll take this one. Um, you just made a statement. Nature does not give us a hint of how to best sample a region. To partition a region. Yes, to partition a region. Or, yes. or, or sample. I mean, in the yeah. end, you know, how you sample it and how you distribute it. And I think I might agree with that because I hate to have the a priori information put in, okay? But what I'm a little bit missing in your answer to our chairman is that there is, of course, a way that nature doesn't just go by it's significantly better on the probability and so on, okay? Because there is tectonics involved, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, you concluded in one of these that indeed there is, I, I, write, I read your two conclusions. The first one is that the spatial value in the valley instrumental parts of mainland California is limited to the range of 
0.94 and 1.15, okay? Yes. Now, there is a, a simple question first. What are the well-instrumented part? Because you didn't say it anywhere in the paper. Within the network. Not, we mean Within not the offshore. Network, because your point is that there are different networks. So, we consider these inner parts well-instrumented because there are well-instruments here. Well, can I, can I then combine the Northern California one with the one that you call Nevada? Because, let's say, if, you, if I have... Nevada is well-instrumented, I would say. Okay, the whole thing. It's not just within one single network, despite the fact that you say the network characteristic definitely make, make the difference there. Because if I look at what you're going to suggest to us, okay, it's actually that the blue, the, the dark blue there, Mendocino, is due, due to poor magnitudes, okay? Yes. But it belongs as part of the northern California. Yes, but, the rest it, of but it's not well instrumented because it's offshore. It, well, part of it is offshore. I do see some blue spots in the well instrumented part, but that's okay, okay? Well, that's not okay, because for me, this is, well, be, if you have a very high B value here, we know that it, it also diffuses, because our model is averaging various size volumes. Does it still diffuse in your model or in the tectonics? It does not diffuse in the tectonics. Oh. We know that our model has the limitation that when you put a very strong singularity, yeah. It tends to diffuse it because the Voronoi's sometimes tend to tessellate it bigger because they are rounded. I agree, but you just said that we can trust it where it's well instrumented. And my point is that you have a Voronoi cell making, putting all of this dark blue to Mendocino, but there is half of this seismicity is actually on land, and there we have a good... But let, let, me, let me continue, no, no, because Eddie. it gets even better, okay? <laughs> it gets even better? Yes. Okay. Because you have before, put, put the thing that you had before, okay? You have the Nevada, leave it, leave that's fine. Okay. You have the Nevada network, okay? Yes. Okay. Because what you are saying, the second thing now is, that except for the geothermal area of the geysers, discrepancies in magnitude estimations between different networks and bias due to magnitude errors alone can explain the observed p-value variations. Yes. So everything except the geysers, yes. you can explain. Would you please first explain. mark in your in this figure here? Could you tell me what is the um, is the anomaly of the geysers? I can't see it. It's red. The, that anomaly you can see here in the paper when we plot it, because to, to be able to say that something is a significant anomaly, you have to have the uncertainties. That's why we can only say something is anomalous when we look at the uncertainties associated with it. Yes, no, 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 but this is and just a projection of the map. Yes, the map but, black okay, off. but this one also has in these black curves the percentiles of confidence. And we say that this is significant because it goes above this line here. Because it has significantly small percentiles. And as you can see, if you compare it to the central San Andreas fault, you can see that it has much wider percentiles. Yes. See, you are staying on your mathematical, statistical things. And I'm trying to get to you, to get to you back the tectonics, because you are trying to image something that is in the tectonics, okay? So let's go back. You have here, another conclusion is that actually you shouldn't trust the 1981 to 2014 data set, because there is a temporal variation that yes. you're after, okay? Mm -hmm. And here I cannot see the difference in, in the in the B value, why if I take the complete data set, there's another figure, if you yeah. go back to that, so you I will see it. Okay. okay? So the first question is there, why do you make a statement that the geysers are locally different from the rest of Northern California, that you see obviously in the full data set, 
-hmm. But at the same time, you are telling me, no, no, this is the data set, the right one, okay, the B on the right you should look at, where I don't see the anomaly, the only anomaly, by the way, that you believe. It's kind of odd to me, isn't it? Well, to us, it was an anomaly because it had significantly higher B value with very uh, narrow percentile confidence intervals. A very narrow confidence. But to answer you the question why we do not want to interpret this map is because you can see features here, features here which are obviously driven by the temporal incompleteness of the network once it's hit by a large earthquake. Yes, let me get to the other point, okay, to really nail it. What you call the Nevada network, I happen personally to know that this was not this always the same Nevada network. Let's, let's go to the Long Valley Caldera, okay? And let's stay here. Okay. You do see the Long Valley Caldera there as a reddish yes. type thing anomaly, okay? Which is totally missing in the 2004 to 2014 data set, okay? And the reason being, it happens to correlate beautifully. You might know about this. There was a whole kind of tectonic unrest in the 1980s, exactly at that point. Now, let me ask you, where would you expect temporal variations more in a plate boundary situation like the strike slip of San Andreas Fault, or in a volcano tectonic region? In a volcano tectonic region. Exactly. And if you did have an unrest in that time period, where you do see a different difference relative to the time where there was no unrest, and by the way, it was the uplift was different, everything was different, okay, that you can have. Plus, I can tell you there is no difference in the network there. That's one I say, you tried everything to explain the features here, and I congratulate you yeah. that you just documented that there is something that we can learn from your data, <laughs> because if you want to interpret, you need an anomaly, an amplitude, that it sticks out, and you need the uncertainties. For the geysers, you document that you have an uncertainty, okay, but you ignore the amplitude. And the same goes for, but for the guys is we don't know what happens really, okay? But it's well documented for one time. Okay, so let me come, like tell you our view on this opinion, on this thing. And I also say that in the conclusion that the the whole catalog should be investigated not only in space but also in time, because of the, exactly the reason that you just stated. Because there are temporal variations, there's also the past spring sequence here. There's also an ocean side, a swarm which comes, then goes, then doesn't ever come back. And we frankly believe that once we start partitioning time and space jointly, when a Voronoi can sit within these five years, within this space, and another Voronoi can sit in the next five years, within another space, then we will be able to see the whole picture. This gives you just a limited picture. And I agree with you that such features can have been missed here because we just look at this. Let me just but say that it's interesting that I can see it already and you say once we have done it, I can see very obviously in you. Because you know that thing that exists. I don't know it. It's kind of strange that you, you tell me I know more about the tectonics that you are, seismic tectonics that you are trying to image. Because your statement is, no, with the exception of the geysers, the rest are errors. I think this is a little bit an overstatement. But I congratulate you again because you just proved to me that there is tectonics in this and the correlation. But let's move No, no, I, I also want to come. You said that there's no difference between Nevada. Difference between what? The Nevada Reno network. The network that you call the Nevada network, okay? Yes. At the time of 1980 till about 1995, yes, was run by Northern California. And you say that these two networks have similar characteristics. 
No, I'm just saying that we, I was a part of it, doing it, yes, and I did. Okay, it but I have that. evidence to show you that indeed they have different characteristics. And we also put this in the thing. Okay, where is this? Okay, here. So, Northern California versus Nevada. <laughs> the same exact earthquakes. Look at the magnitude discrepancy. If they would be located, they would be estimated, they would have estimated the same magnitude, you would just see a straight line. And what do we see? We see that there's a significant overestimation of the uh, Northern California magnitude with respect to the Nevada magnitude. But you're not, you should only take and compare, do this comparison for a long value. There are 20,000 dollars. But they are is. using a different approach to calculate these magnitudes. If they can That's get fine. systematic okay. differences. Okay. I can see an anomaly where you do simply do not believe. There is an because you believe. And, and you know. And I don't know, so I have a, a zero prior. That's why I believe. So you neglect the volcano tectonic field. I should look at it myself. Yes, it's published. Okay, I will. <laughs> I mean, but we need data. I mean, to 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 enforce a statistical significance idea, I need data. Okay. Yeah, I have one more question. Just go into the way the other side. Can you put on your figure six thirteen? Six thirteen. What was the fig figure about, Eddie? Ah, no. This is the multifaction analysis of the so-called, what as you would say, best data set at the moment that we have. Okay. So you disagree. What? You call it so-called, so you disagree. No, no, no. So-called. That's fine. That's a, just wait a minute. Just wait. A minute. I'm just trying to get where you're going with it. So. Yes. You explained very nicely about the problem, the feature that we had in the previous ones. Okay, you can take this this um, part there. What is now remaining is we lost the one, the, the, the very pronounced one of the lower limits of the location precision, which then was due to an inconsistency, systematic difference, because some was double difference and the other one was really normally singular end locations, okay? And that produced this one there, a very nice one. Fine, so now let's go first and you explain this. That's the thickness of the seismic <coughs> zone yes. that we see somewhere there near 12 to 13 km kilometers and yeah. so on. And it makes a lot of sense, okay? You have not, in my opinion, even started to comment on or to interpret Another most obvious feature in this anomaly, okay? Mm -hmm. Would you care to comment on the one, yes, there, that is visible in many other ones, even in the not so good catalog? Mm -hmm. So, what is that? Okay, so to show you the slide. So indeed, you are right that it is observed on different catalogs here. So if you would consider how the bare centric fixed method works, is that you have a circle of a fixed mass that have a certain number of points. Then you expand it. And you can use this circle in, in creating these curves, which we have here. These are all curves of mass versus radius. You can only use it where it satisfies the bare centric criteria. The bare centric criteria being that if I calculate the bare center of this mass, which is covered in this circle, the bare center is the closest point to the pivot point that I started expanding. So this gives you, if you look at how this behaves on a regular DLA, so here you see this, the mass of three and the circles that are covering it. And when I increase the mass, you see that I have particular circles which can cover it. And for example, if I stop at this mass, mass of 600, 
These are the uh, five circles that I covered it. But the method could have put these circles in these black locations too, because they are also satisfied the best centric fix, uh, fixed mass criteria. So when you think in terms of this in, uh, in the network, when you start expanding, first, when you hit the uh, seismogenic thickness, you get a reduction. But then, when you continue expanding, what happens is that you reach other neighboring faults. And when you reach them, because now you are sampling empty space, you reach them, and now you increase your mass. So you increase your, uh, the rate of mass that you're getting. And this causes this feature that we see on all these, uh, these, these figures here. So we could say that this tends to be like a characteristic uh, distance between fault strands. And if yes. you look at the map, you can also kind of see it. Oh, isn't that an important point that would be worth mentioning? Could you please put on the California, the whole California, because this refers to Southern California. Yes. And then I would like to have your explanation of it, tectonic views, if the, from the seismicity. Would you expect the same thing for Central and Northern California? No. If not, why not? No, because in the north, as you could see from here, we, co we have only one strand. So we wouldn't expect it. Well, we have two strands. Well, we have west, one as far away. Exactly. So this is a beautiful thing, OK? You happen to the comment on the seismogenic zone, which is kind of difficult to see because it's not such a pronounced anomaly. But you happen to totally ignore the most important feature that for the first time you can actually start to understand from the small folds, how they are within a fold, to the pattern. Because what you don't show there so much is that you have a box. Okay, there is a block tectonic structure, and you actually, and it would be interesting to me, do you think that these blocks have some kind of a scale length of 50 kilometers? Did you check? In the north? No, in the south. In the south. I, I didn't check. But well, to me, I, I, I don't... Okay. Well, I'm not so excited about these results because you can already see it by looking at the seismicity. You can see how much they are separated away from you. Yes, but, can but you cannot see the depth. See, I can see a lot of other things, okay, that you do though totally ignore. But you have a tool that is aiming, you answered to Dave correctly, and I think you have a fantastic tool, Jabor, that allows us to see things that we are not so easily be able to see. But before you convince any geologist that you can see patterns, features, characteristics in the seismicity, you should see the seismicity in the characteristics that a simple geologist or seismologist like me knows since 10 years. Okay. This is the most important part, okay, that you should do. No, the words of validation is called validation <laughs> <laughs> something else. Okay. <laughs> yes. So well, I don't have many questions, obviously, with your interaction. So only two questions. Uh, the first one concerns the paper with Stefan about the forecast. So you had a figure in your in your talk. Yes, this one. So where we no no this one. Yes. So where we see a comparison between your two models and the one of Elstetter as reference. And where would stand the other competing models on this graph? They should be approximately at minus one uh, for the best ones. The, the yes. other, like yes. Schoenemer and... Yeah. Yes, so we have... So apparently, yes, they are at minus one. And they are down here, here. Okay. So, well, so that indeed the improvement of your, model, of your models of your setter might be significant. Yes, they are not very, very impressive, are they? Um, no, because you claim hard to be impressed in this field. Sorry? This is, like, this is not medicine or... It's this is a question. This is not I mean, Dave medicine. can tell you, when was the last time, Dave, that you were impressed by some forecast results? <laughs> I mean. 
Yes, yes, but Dave has a PhD already, yeah. so... <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to answer my question. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not impressed. No, so, so because, okay, so in the paper you claim that the authors claim uh, that there is some promise in those results, but what I see is that then if I input the b-value variations, I don't obtain such a step in performance of the model compared to the performance of Einstein compared to uh, Schrodinger and Dimmer. And so I would like to know what you think about this. So for example, is it really worth including the b-values in forecast? Um. I believe it is because we know for a fact, and for this I want to show you this figure. What do we mean by for a fact? For a fact we mean that this, we mean for a fact this. We know that as magnitude errors increase, because magnitude errors increase with magnitude, this causes a bias in the b-value. This means that if your target events, their magnitudes are biased, are miscalculated, and you try to ignore the fact that humans can do error, that humans don't know how to calculate magnitude and stuff, or that we have instrument deficiencies, and we are unable to calculate magnitude, you will perform poorly not due to your physical uh, knowledge deficiency, but because you, you, you forget to take into account this instrumentational limitation. And this is exactly what we see in Mendocino. Because in the Mendocino, we have uh, high completeness. Most of the events that you can use for b-value estimation there are high magnitude events. And their magnitude uncertainties increase. And they, when they increase, they push up the exponent. So indeed, it's important to add them in here. Of course, this also means that the gain that we are actually achieving is not due to our physical understanding getting better, but it's our, due to our human knowledge. Okay, but so you have a bias in the magnitude estimations, but this bias is present in the training data set and in the validation data set. So this is fully consistent. So I would expect then the model to perform largely better than one with a uniform because indeed you almost input b values variation by hand doing this. I mean, by the magnitude bias, it's just as if you if you were tuning the b values by hand in different regions. And despite this, you don't progress that much in the skill of, of the forecast. So this is why I'm asking this question. So is it worth really putting a lot of effort on the b value? Yeah, it method? is because we still we know still that our method still has. Uh, ways to improve and if you see you can immediately see it in the synthetic that it actually has a lot of place to be improved so and here maybe a complementary question this is why is it improving so little so yes i'm I, I, I am i'm i'm but answering that's a question. yes i'm answering why is it improving so little? because it's not the best as it could be and you can see it in, on the synthetic we created this synthetic by inputting a b value of 0 0.8 here 0 0.95 here one point only in the small circle, and the rest was supposed to be green. But as you can see, when we invert for the synthetic, we do not get the rest green. We have this thing here, the high B value that we have here, that it smears out, outside its box. And it does that because we have just a blind way of randomly putting Voronoi's and then averaging them. If we can, and we know how to, because we now are familiar with top-down approaches, if we can constrain this p-value here, and that is exactly what Helmstetter did, she put a, just a round circle there, and she uh, hand by hand input the b-value there, which she estimated as 2 somehow. So if we can force our model to not do this smearing, then we will get even more improvement of this. And we believe that using a bottom-up approach, yes, a bottom-up approach, for example, we can like a default network. Or by using nested Voronoi cells, you create a one Voronoi and then you start subdividing within the Voronoi that we can improve this performance. So that's why the reason that it's not so um, impressive in terms of performance. But it still is a game. I mean, 
uh, Anatoly Roshun is quite general, so yesterday they provided us an overview about what can be the impact of seismic tectonics onto seismic hazard. And so my question is the reverse, is that so what you did during those last four years is about statistical seismology, and but can you give us, I don't know, some clues about the impact it could have on seismic tectonics? Yes, so if you, I think what could have impact on seismotectonics is the fault network because this is the most detailed thing that we are able to extract. So uh, by using this fault network, you can, for example, map seismotectonic features like faults which have not been mapped uh, before due to lack of surface ruptures. We can also uh, use this as a way to, for example, uh, project um, strain rates or GPS measurements on them because they are really the best thing that you could map with seismicity because they are the optimally smooth uh, things. We can also look into uh, general statistical distributions of this. We can see how the, the length scales on a big fault segment, how segmented it is. We can see what's the uh, average thickness, also considering the location uncertainties again. We can also infer such features, general features of tectonics. Also, we can uh, use these to, mm, as physical constraints, again, as I already said, on the focal mechanisms, which would allow us to, to reconstruct a better stress field in these regions because the focal uh, plane ambiguity is one of the main things that hinders us from doing this. So these are the, in the ways in which this can provide the uh, classical community of seismic Thank you. Okay. So maybe I say a word. Um, I have one question. So, uh, I think all of us can have an appreciation of how fun it was to work with uh, Yavro for this uh, yeah, almost four years now, right? And we organized the uh, work, the thesis, by the absolutely regular, monthly, in-depth uh, round of discussion presentation of four hours every, or at least. And you can imagine the type of debate that we had. It was extraordinary, constructive, and it's, it was really fun to, to work with Yavro and with Shyam also, and with Guy and, and others who joined us during these meetings. And I can say that uh, the, uh, one of the main advisors uh, it has been really uh, one of the rare pleasure at this level to have such a PhD who you can see is uh, not only extraordinarily gifted in uh, you know, technical stuff and it is, but has also an acute, uh, uh, inquisitive mind uh, and pushes uh, his, um, his research to really test the the different hypotheses that we discussed, so it was uh, really understanding. Now, uh, I can ask a question on the on one of the few words that have not been involved, we have not been really sharing the discussion, which is the first one on the B value. And if you can put up the slide, uh, which shows the Gunnar distribution on the specific bone of cell that shows the mental scene origin, I'm a bit worried by one aspect, which is the Voila. Okay, so you have this distribution, and I'm going to play a bit of game of AB, showing that you have a big pattern uh, in this distribution that you completely miss by this power distribution, the straight line and so blah blah, which is the sugar at the end. Which is, of course, that you have like, I don't know how many, 10 events above, magnitude 6 and above, or 5 and a half, 5 and a half above, which are not accounted for by this distribution. And we know that these events are the most fertile uh, in terms of uh, predicting future events and so on. So you have a big discussion about how you know, improving the value accounting for all the problems and so on networks can improve forecasting. My worry is that you're actually missing the elephant of the room, which is that indeed uh, not accounting for 10 events which are on the very large tail is going to dominate actually the fertility and the productivity and the, and the rate for forecast. So there are several questions, actually. So one question, but several branches. One is um, how much cost and would be feasible to um, enlarge your model 
by, for example, accounting for one additional parameter to account for these kind of characters, the earthquake that appear through your overall noise isolation because you isolate specific region of around the forms. And uh, we think that it might have an impact on the forecast skills. So modifying the tail becomes problematic. This was also one of the issues that was raised by the reviewers because they said, why are you not fitting a tapered Gutenberg with the law? And the problem becomes when you have several models and you want to average them, what do you do with these different tapers in each region? The problem... This is not a taper, right? This is a yeah, taper. Then you would, yes, then you would add this kink here yeah. and you would have two exponents. But then when this Voronoi extends here, you would have a different kink and then when I want to tr try to infer an ensemble, I would have to average these kinks. How would I do that? Because these kinks would have a different starting magnitude and they, they will have a different, that's the main problem, that they will have a different starting magnitude. And then I wouldn't know how to create an ensemble model from this. And that's the simplicity that helps us here is that it's fairly simple when you have only one exponent, you just uh, take the okay, so middle. Okay. So that's what the reason that we didn't know how to do that. And do you think you are missing a bit by not being able? I mean, essentially, you are telling me that you didn't do it like you know the uh, famous uh, guy uh, looking at his key under the dark night, dark night, uh, dark night the lamppost. Essentially, you are giving me this argument that you know I could not do it otherwise. And it's, uh, but uh, the reality that it is there. So we did have a big cost in conclusion that you have intuitively or you, you think it's, there, is, there are arguments to suggest that indeed you are well informed to make like that? I am uh, it would be less convincing if you would add such a complexity because you know that the Gutenberg Richter law does not feature such a does not have such a feature. So if I now say Guys, I'm going to go with my Voronoi's and fit something which is not observed actually. That's also another. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, now you are taking, taking Gutenberg as a dogma. Well, uh, it, it is globally observed, it is observed also in mind, so it would make the, the method less appealing to people. But I agree that this could be a first approach, and then seeing this as we kind of showed it here. Science is not about pleasing people. But I, I dispute your statement that this is against Gutenberg Richter. I think if you take uh, and simulate this distribution. Yeah, you can get this from me, yeah. Yeah, if you, you, you know, simulate a thousand catalogs, you'll find many of them have more uh, earthquakes above magnitude five or above magnitude six. Exactly, but if we were to apply what uh, Didier is suggesting, we would again t uh, test this model with a kink for significance, if this complexity of the king is indeed uh, significant, we would... And even if it comes from statistics, as they say, you need, therefore, to weight the likelihood of such... I mean, I, I would claim that this deviation is quite unlikely. Maybe in 1,000, you, can, you, you, you find a few, but already unlikely. So you, have, you, you need to actually prove the model for value. Yeah. No, and it's, it's rather, I tell you, you you should plot the magnitude, the location of the magnitude six events. Let's do, we'll do that afterward. And then you will understand what this is. And I can draw. Rare events can be squared in one to use duration vertex. Sorry? For rare events, if you have learned, then you, want to, you don't want to use frequency, frequency, but you want to use duration vertex. Otherwise, yeah. you have the bias. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have a bit more statistics. Yeah, you can always test them with BIC because they would have different number of free parameters and you can test them if the provided likelihood gain exceeds the penalty. I guess Dave had extra questions. Thank you. Yeah, I have other questions. I won't go on forever, but um, I'll ask you a, a question that I'm often asked. Um, how can you learn much about earthquakes when you have only a catalog that's a few decades at most. That's just a snapshot. And that snapshot doesn't include probably the six or eight largest earthquakes that we know about. 
starting with 1857 and uh, 1906 and 1872. Um, these are big earthquakes, and they occur precisely on faults. I'm quoting other people now. I'm not, I'm not saying that I know this to be the truth, but what I hear. And these faults are very, very narrow. You can dig a trench across a fault um, 10 meters and see that the fault comes through with something about the size of your hand. And that the big faults that we care about, that your uncle cares about, are ones that are trapped on a fault. And these statistics are talking about a different class of earthquakes. Would, would you dispute that? I would dispute that, yes, because such a thing would dispute the self-similar uh, structure of earthquakes that we see everywhere. But you see the self-similarity in these earthquakes. But do you see them in the big ones that people care about? Well, the... These earthquakes are not points, for one thing. You've, you've got hypocenters. And the big earthquakes are at least a surface and maybe... Yes, but your question suggests that big earthquakes behave differently than small ones. Yes, maybe. yes. I tend to believe that this is not so. Bec not tend to believe, but I am uh, inclined by the Gutenberg-Richter law and by the here the multifractal spectra that you show that holds all the way down to the location uncertainty that tells you that the magnitude distribution of this earthquake is self-similar, the spatial distribution of these earthquakes is self-similar. So I don't understand where do people get this idea that big earthquakes are different than small ones. From the, <laughs> but I show you the location, the magnitude there. analysis that this is correct if you go to the lower scale. Upper scale, there, was, there were two breaks before you got to the anomaly. There is indeed a suggestion in your multifraction analysis that the Gutenberg rift is approximately up to maybe 30 kilometers in this, in this data set. It's self-consistent. But the rest, the real big events, they aren't. They have their own anomaly. Hmm. You want to use the results like this? Hmm. Well, tell me if I'm wrong, or if I interpret. This is just the first looking at your data. Okay, then to, to, to answer then in this regard this question. You saw that it, in all these analyses, be it the B-value or the multifactor analysis, each earthquake counts as one. And so also when you are calculating B values with the Aki's uh, maximum likelihood estimator, you know that big events don't count so much because they are less numerous. So all our statistical methods, similarly the multifractal analysis, they tend to disregard the magnitude of these events. So if you want to, if you are convinced that big earthquakes differ significantly in their physics from small ones, then you have to introduce a new philosophy of dealing with them. Because the way that currently we are dealing with them, the state of the art, that is, disregards their magnitudes, basically. Because in all, all my fault reconstructions, I take them as points. In gutenberg richter law, Aki takes them as counting as just one. And in all the other methods, they are, count, they, they are counted equivalently if they are above the magnitude threshold. So, this would require a new philosophy of it, as looking at uh, seismic data. Yeah. So, not new to humanity, but maybe new to us. Um, <laughs> but then it would be the problem would be that how can you make such a philosophy without being arbitrary, without introducing arbitrary uh, parameters, or without making assumptions? which you are going to then test. That becomes the problem, because here we have no assumptions. That's More or less. Kind of enriching the data by not only seismology, but by... We want to learn. And so on. We want to learn. So your uncle can be safe. <laughs> and you should, actually, you should be open because the group. We have introduced the concept of Dragon Kings, which precisely question the extension of so-called self-similarity that is based on the crowd of events which are small by definition. So it doesn't matter if it would be naive or short-sighted to 
completely exclude the possibility that something is beyond the horizon of human visibility. But I'm just saying that, saying that technically doing this would require joining data sets which have inconsistent errors. For example, here, our errors are larger for these guys which are offshore. If I want to include another data set of, let's say, a creep or strain rate, that data set would have errors in different regions. And then when you overlap them and when you join them, how would you know that what you get out of this thing is not just a mishmash of this error interacting and giving you weird features? That, that's a technical problem, of course, which has to be tackled, maybe. But I don't see this as a downside of this approach because we uh, chose to remain pure by not adding this data. Okay, so perhaps we, we can see. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.